We can do this. Yeah. Let's just do it. All right. Come on. From deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan, it's the Grace and Paul Podcast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. Together, they're raising an ever-growing army of adorable children and planning the revolution. Hello! I use that, actually, uh, as a level check. Yeah. Like in the finished file to verify that I am have the, the level set correctly. Oh, so there's some use of the wolf call? <laughs> It's not just some stupid thing I do. <laughs> well, I, I had talked about, you know, I keep wanting to produce a whole blown, a full blown, um, you know, trailer with sound effects. I've looked for like coyote and wolf sound effects. I think we're going to have to record them. We might have to. Well, we don't actually have wolves in our woods. No, but we have coyotes. We do. Close enough. I, and actually, coyotes make a more disturbing sound. Yeah, it is a little disturbing. All right. It's very yeah. unsettling. Like, you know, they're, they're coming out. Because there are a lot of them. Yeah. yeah, a lot of them, they're making these un, unholy sounds. Yeah. yeah. So you might hear in the background uh, water, like a water tap running. Yeah. Our boys upstairs are washing their feet. <laughs> it was time. Okay. They're, all, <laughs> they're all clustered around the tub, hopefully doing a good job washing their feet and hopefully not flooding the bathroom. Or like smearing dirt on the walls. Yeah, because their feet were so disgusting. They would go barefoot a lot, a lot. and um, lot. it kind of anyway. builds up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but no, they were barefoot around the house and the yard a lot here. Right. Yeah. So it's so, par for the uh, course. So and uh, yeah, okay. So um, we're r- running late today. Shocker. We missed a show last week because and we that just... That actually is a bit shocking because we usually tough it out somewhere. Now. We usually tough it out. We just, just was... Everything was getting to be too late. Too late, too much. And there's... Honestly, I feel my brain overloaded with too many topics to talk about. Mm-hmm. So I think um, we're going to have you read your talk and say a little bit about what Front Porch Republic was that yeah, what the, 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 conference, the was. conference was yeah because uh, uh solidarity hall and uh front porch i think are just about the only places i could direct people to on the web to say yeah that's that's my kind of conservatism that's right your I'm kind at. of thing that's my thing that's what i'm doing that's this what i'm talking about is my jam <laughs> this is my jam yeah. uh so yeah i mean I, I there's a little bit of me over at american conservative but i, I yeah. don't think it's wholly reflective of my values yeah but uh solidarity hall is front front porch republic really is mm-hmm. yeah okay. um so there are a couple of organizations uh, you know what and strong towns is too strong towns is my kind of conservatism yeah and um urban uh, planning the urban planning and this commitment to um sustainable so, growth s- sustainable growth solvency and actually serving the people that live there yeah. yeah, these things, the conservatives have no place in their lives for these ideas. <laughs> these ideas. Really, seriously. These issues. Uh, so, um, so those are three places that if you are like, so what do you mean you're a conservative? What the hell is that? Yeah. So like, you don't, you want to burn gay people at the stake? Uh, no, Actually, I want to no. conserve things. I want to conserve <laughs> things. Uh, truth and beauty, specifically, uh, uh, but yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm about. I, I want to conserve culture, you know. Exactly. But, so, you know, so to flesh. Not, I don't yeah. just want to conserve it. I want to create it and I want to spread Spread it and promote it, you know. But what are you, some kind of like white savior? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> but th- this, um, so I, I know people are like, so what are you even talking about? You know, left wing conservative. Yeah, yeah. Well, those are three places you can go on the web that might. Yeah, and maybe yeah, you'll get a anyway. sense from this talk. We were just talking about how you are. You do consider yourself a feminist. Yes. And this is actually coming up organically because tonight, dun, dun, dun. and I, I'm, I'm avoiding spoilers um, because we haven't seen it yet, but it's already happened, mm-hmm. was the premiere of the 13th Doctor, Doctor Who. Yeah. Yep. And it's a woman this time. It's a woman this time. And we're kind of taking, uh, we're trying to set our expectations low, let's just say. Yeah. And not... Because it's a woman, but because um, the writers know that it's a woman. Right. Right. <laughs> right? And it's, you, you may it, have noticed that conventionally, yeah. women aren't handled well in the no, media. No. Yeah. Female and, characters, women's roles. And, yeah. you know, I get a lot of pushback when I talk about this 
But I do believe that uh, Stephen Moffat exhibited an awful lot of misogyny in his, in his he scripts. Well, he has gone home. So Thank the God. show has a new showrunner. It's time. But it is, I think, confusing because it doesn't make any sense continuity-wise to say, oh, yeah, no, the Doctor could have been a woman all the t- time, all along, right? <laughs> it's just we've had 12 that have been white men. You yeah, know. now suddenly... Now suddenly... It's like this. It's like this. and it, But that no, he could have regenerated... You know, if you're flipping coins and you flip, you know, 12 heads in a row, you've got a defective coin or, you know, you've had the world's most amazing streak of, of luck. Yeah. And right. if anyone would have a, an amazing streak of luck, it would be the doctor. <laughs> but, but, sure. point taken. But it's a, it doesn't, so continuity-wise, it doesn't really make any sense that the doctor was fundamentally male and is now a, a female character. And that's just how, like, the show was. I mean, his character regenerates, but his personality somehow, I don't know, is there, probably get pushed back on this, is there a male and female personality? His personality somehow, his his uh, his gender was somehow I, embedded in something that transcended all these regenerations, right? Right. The core of his being that, that was preserved across regenerations was male. Right. Uh, at least that's what it seemed like. That's what they were communicating for the last 50 years. Right, right. Yeah, so. more literally over 50 years, right? <laughs> so, uh, they. Uh, but uh, what I'm wondering, are they going to have some in-universe explanation for why he is now he, a she, you know, so... You know, I will have to walk up, get up and leave if the in-universe explanation is that he's trans. <laughs> Okay. I will have to just leave. <laughs> well, the, because the, that's uh, a I, I little don't know. too ripped from today's headlines. A little too, too ripped. Well, and not just. It's a bit. Um, you know what's that thing when people take the language from an oppressed group? Yes. Yes. That that's it, it was just it would just be too sickening for me to even yeah, watch. Yeah, it's um, cultural appropriation. It, it's basically a form of cultural appropriation where like oh. Yeah. We're we're doing it too now. See how cool yeah, we are. Right, right, I, I just right. I don't want to be there for that. Yeah, they don't need cred in that way. Please. Right, Please. but you know I do want to give this new showrunner and, give and him a, he, chance. a chance. But and I have to say the the I the last couple seasons of Capaldi had a handful of great shows. Yes, like holy crap, that was amazing shows. Yes. Right, like like Hugo Worthy, yeah. Well, and and, and Cavalli lo- was there to deliver. Right, he just wasn't getting a lot of good scripts. But a lot of them, they just weren't written that well. No, and he so. really tried. He tried. Did what he but could. if he's got a lame, confusing, muddled, overly complicated script, then, um, you, and a lot of those shows were just that overly complicated, too many plot elements, too confusing, not focused on the characters, not. Focus. Uh, you don't feel a peril. You don't feel a no, an nothing. arc. You know, it's just like, huh? This is confusing. I, Either I think, that, or they, or they raised the stakes in the first opening seconds to be unbelievable. Where do you? And go they from did there? that a lot too. Like, oh, the universe has been destroyed, and the Doctor's dead. Like, okay, well, then you're watching with like disinterest like, because yeah, so you're like well whatever uh, whatever you know it's already happened so if if the worst possible scenario has already happened in the opening before the opening credits you know then you're kind of like oh, oh, well. right, fine i guess i'm here now i may as well watch this A- anyway so we i i sus- subscribed on itunes um although i don't love to support apple anymore but I get these uh, gift cards as a bonus for my credit card. Bing. Yeah. So every time I I charge way too much on the credit card, you get rewarded. By I Apple. get rewarded. So it's like the wrong uh, button is being pushed in my brain. In but, every way. Yeah. yeah. But the the net result is that I have like you know a large credit on the iTunes store. So it was a no brainer to. Uh, Get a season of Doctor to Who. To get a season pass for Doctor Who. So tomorrow, sometime during the night or early morning, it'll become available. And I'll just be able to download it after work tomorrow, and then we can watch the premiere. And watch it. So a so day late. Happens. Yeah, you know. And you said, 
if it's totally stupid, you're not watching another show not watching on this anymore. season. No, I, right. life's too short. You know. Yeah. On, and and I and I would actually encourage Veronica not to watch, yeah. just because I don't want her programmed with all that bullshit. Right now, about speaking women. of bullshit, yeah. on uh, Boing Boing, someone is sharing a link to a special limited edition Barbie Doctor Thirteenth <laughs> Doctor Barbie. It's a Barbie. I like. Oh my god! And again, like. I love the idea that the doctor has action figures. That's great. And kids will collect and play with the action doctors, right? right? That'd be great. But an action figure of the doctor doesn't have like legs that are three times longer than her torso, you know, that no. are unnaturally long and like is uh, is constructed in a way that if she were a real, if the doll was suddenly That's turned into a human woman, people would would their eyes would bug Gasping out they would heart. run in terror and when Gasping she tried to heart. speak her ankle or tried to walk her ankles, her would, ankles break. would break and she'd fall over because of the length of her own legs yeah, yeah. so but, they, but there also was a, a really cool funko uh funko pop yeah, with the, the bobblehead the bobblehead doll that looks great so we wouldn't if you want to buy a doctor who action figure we would encourage the the bobblehead the bobblehead funko you can send me one of pop. missy if you're like looking for something to do uh, yeah you can send me a missy your, missy was your favorite feminist character oh, in doctor great. who she was truly an equal opportunity psychopath. Right? Absolutely. Oh gosh, she was wonderful, and the actress <laughs> the really actress just was terrific. Ate it up. I don't even know her name, which yeah. is too bad. But well, no, um, the, there were two. There were two um, female Doctor Who characters that I thought were just were good. Good. I mean, just yeah. solidly good. Delivered every time. Convincing. Convincing. Believable. Not poli- pandering. Not pandering. Right. Um, and I'll. I'll dare to use the word authentic. Yeah. Right? For a science fantasy show. Right, for a science fantasy show. Yeah. Um, There was Sarah, uh, Donna Noble. Yeah. And Missy. Yeah. And Missy was a Time Lord. Yeah. Time Lords can be girls too. She was a Time Lady. Right, right. And... But she was yeah. she was a reincarnation. Well, so they did kind of set it up. They kind of set up... Having a female doctor because... Well, you know what? So I kind of moderate my earlier comments about how the doctor they, has sort of been irreducibly male. They but, kind of yeah. open that door with right, Missy. Right, right, with Missy. Right, because she's the master reincarnated right. as a woman. Yeah, uh, uh, in a new uh, and incarnation. For anyone who's watched the show, yeah. Missy is unmistakably the master. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Personality-wise. Personality-wise. Yeah. I mean, it's all there. Yeah. So, like, all the Stephen Moffat things that he wanted to do about how women are crazy, yeah. he could he actually... He got to do it. He got to do it without, like, <laughs> insulting women because the master right, is crazy. Right, because the character is already well-established as, as a stone-cold cold psychopath. Soci- psych- not just... Uh, yeah, a psychopath. Psychopath, right? right? And gle- glib, glib and gleeful, gleeful and pretty much... Psychopath. Despite the doctor's best efforts, and even the character's best Your efforts character. at time to like, to like, re, to to change, to dial it back and to, just come to, back to, to like, reality, to like be be redeemed in some way. It's just, just like can't nah, do it's it. That's not who I am. Not who I am. Not what I'm about. Yeah. So so Stephen Moffat could still be a misogynist and, <laughs> but, and have this great character. It seemed yeah. like a you know, good match. Yeah. I don't know what happened with Donna Noble. I think because she was this working class. Why character, she was written out. No, no, not why she was written, but like why she was um, treated respectfully. Oh, yeah. As a woman. Uh, well, I, this is my theory. So the the woman that that played her. Yes. Uh, I, again, I I don't know. I you know I, I I'm not enough know of a fan to like you know, learn everybody's characters. everybody's all the actors' names. Yeah, I remember the doctors, right. most of the doctors' actors' names. Right. But that's but um, tenuous. No, I think Donna Noble was already like an established comic and had an established yeah. comic career, mm-hmm. and as a ball breaker, you know, as like a a, a real. Um, I don't even know. What Almost the, a little bit of the char- the character Donna Noble. Yeah, like right. very right. sarcastic, very brutal sense of humor, and like to, like to, and self possessed. Yeah, self possessed, and and like to sort of, uh, take men down a notch in her sketches with men. Oh right, right. right. And so they either used that, or right. she pushed for that, or something. But yeah, that came through in the character. Because the alternative would have been to like make her simper you know something else or, which just wouldn't would right. have been again just another insulting right. female character um but donna noble really was yeah. great and her 
end yeah. was was utterly tragic utterly tragic but but convincing and satisfying at the yeah, same time at the like, same time what happens when humans get to in, involved in being a time lord you know yeah, what does that yeah. do to them you get, get in too deep yeah so yeah. yeah it was so those were actually the only two characters that i've seen almost at all that yeah. seem successful yeah. sarah jane it like comes close to being mm-hmm. a successful female character but doctor who really doesn't seem to do this well what about the prime minister Oh God! No, I liked her too. Yeah, I liked her too, especially the way they kind of redeemed her, and almost made made her. Uh, um, her end was extraordinarily heroic. Yeah, she had a great heroic end. She did. I really appreciate that. But she that. had basically become a a real dark, really dark person yeah. in the way she liked to d- d- destroy whole alien races. Yes, you know? yes. It made some made some bad decisions. I, I think I think that's why. She doesn't like leap to mind. I loved her character in in broad strokes. Yeah. But she doesn't leap to mind because that, like that sort of, um, um, it's almost like I name a single other male character who makes those who made that kind of tragic mistake mm-hmm. so deeply contrary to the character that's been presented. Mm-hmm. It's this thing that I think Moffat had that women are fa- are fatally flawed. Yeah, could and be. And he seems to could do be. this over and over again. This idea, well, you know, women are fatally flawed. They do these things. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I can't recall. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I'm, I'm wrong. I, it happens. Um, I, I don't think he ever. I don't think he had any male characters he treated in that fashion, where they make a fundamentally grotesque error in judgment. Mm-hmm. Right. That's just kind of. Which, frankly, let's be honest about men in the real world. Sure. That's kind of a daily occurrence. <laughs> yes. That men decide to commit genocide. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Or well, whatever crime. Or whatever, whatever kind of crime of that magnitude. Uh, so the idea that there's a genocide that didn't, that never, didn't need to happen. Right. And it was committed by a woman is just perverse. Mm-hmm. And also this sort of earthy, pragmatic level-headed woman yeah would rashly commit genocide right right that i mean what it didn't seem i mean the only thing they didn't say is that she was on, that she was menstruating at the time <laughs> right it it seemed out of character to me so, i'm not yeah, sure why know. it did seem like a leap to have her suddenly it's but you know i think i think it was actually about thatcher right you know and her oh. shocking you know this is a supposedly shocking neoliberal decisions. If you know, policies. if it was about Thatcher, yeah, I could see that commentary about Thatcher, but it wouldn't have been the prime minister. I mean, no, Thatcher was never earthy and pragmatic, okay. and you or, know, or Thatcherism. Thatcherism. You know, I yeah. think that's a fair. I think it's an entirely fair commentary about Thatcherism. Mm-hmm. The neoliberalism and, and neoliberalism. Yeah. I don't know that. This, I mean, that's people was, who are, uh, you know, by all lights, they're good people. They're moral characters. They went to the best schools. They have the best of intentions that's and whatnot. The, and then that's they the commit, first red flag. And then they commit, yeah, right. <laughs> but, and then they commit horribly, horribly wrongheaded, dangerous, egregious crimes, egregious crimes against humanity or, right. or well, I, I, alien I, races. I, I think, I think that's like liberal framing of it. Yeah. Yeah. Which we could get into. But, but. Thatcher was not a country bumpkin. No, no. Right? No. Which is who this character was. Yeah. Right. So That's true. She was like Yeah, didn't she she came to power cuz she was like the last surviving The last surviving person, person with ca- in, uh, in cabinet, right? Right. <laughs> because had credentials of, uh, of any kind. And she right. was way underqualified for the role Anything. she suddenly found herself right. in. Right. Because everyone right. else was dead. Right. And she, the only reason she was alive is cuz she was like like in the bathroom was right. like <laughs> late late getting there yeah, on a train cuz she had to walk half the way. Some yeah. some bizarre yeah. thing about her otherness right. Right. and outsiderness right. that I'll put her in this position. Right. So that um, yeah, it's been a while since I watched that, and that's episode. not Thatcher. No, 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 of course. Not. Okay, so all if right, he wanted right. to communicate Thatcher, all right. there was a different setup for that. Yeah, um, and you know what? I think if he'd communicated Thatcher, and I got that, mm-hmm. I could totally see that as a reasonable 
plot twist or plot turn. Right. Of course right. she's going to invade the Falklands or, right. <laughs> or you know, yeah, destroy we're about the Thatcher. coal miners, you know, so. Right. Beat him to death. You know, of course. Yeah. It may, just makes sense. Yeah. And then you can have a whole conversation about the way that women break the glass ceiling <laughs> by not disturbing anything right. and actually perpetuating the set. We can have that right. conversation. We could right. do that. He wasn't trying to do that, no. in my opinion. Yeah. Well, so, anyway, so we... we so, so far afield... I'm sick of Stephen Moffat's misogyny. Yeah. I don't have a lot of hope that this is going to be a generous or even fair treatment no. of a strong female no. character. No. And but, I've, you know, I've had I had issues even with the recent um, Capaldi episodes with the way the treatment of um, Bill Oh yeah, yeah. And you know, I uh, although yeah. I really did like ultimately. I like the actress. Ultimately, I liked the actress, and I thought she did great work in a couple of the shows. Some of the form- performances were amazing. Were were downright amazing, yeah. but I didn't like the way some of the scripts uh, yeah. used her. So anyway, so we're yeah, we're like we said, I'm cautiously optimistic that maybe this new series will be worth watching. But I'm we're, not optimistic actually. But, but yeah. okay, but lowering our expectations and ready to. Uh, Ditch it if it's yes yeah and I can't watch that yeah because I'm basically getting it for free right, right. so um, yeah, we're not watching that so I mean I, I, and I the, the boys could watch it I think it actually yeah. would be more damaging to Veronica to Veronica to watch yeah. women portrayed this way yeah so, so you know yeah. if she's uh, Doctor Who Barbie in the show I'll I'll be the first to delete the files so thank goodness yeah. thank goodness for that so all that to say. Doctor so we, Who's coming up. We may have a review next week. Yeah, probably. We'll see. We'll see. I mean, I may not, I may not feel like it's worth commenting on. Yeah, it <laughs> may all. not. It may not be. If it's just like a mediocre show, just like, oh, it's just yeah, not. It's, there's more to on. more to talk about. Right. Um, yeah, there, there's there's a lot of news that I just feel is not worth commentary. Did you want to talk about? Um, let's. You had a comment about. The significance of the Supreme Court appointments in in most people's lives, and how that seemed to be like an overlooked thing with the people who are who are really becoming very en- enraged and engaged in the Kavanaugh nomination. Oh, was this the, the white feminism thing? Yeah. Oh yeah, this whole meltdown, this sort of like public meltdown. Yeah. About Kavanaugh, is a white feminist thing. Yeah, it's not like it's not a feminist thing. Um, it's not, or it's not a universal feminist thing. Well, it, well, feminist feminism is universal. Right. It's a white feminist thing. Yeah, that this is. Um, oh gosh, and it, this this is not to say that sexual assault is a white feminist thing. No, it, it's really not. I no. think the 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 real issues around se- sexual assault, um, are. It's the fight to have in feminism now, right? Yeah, and they're not even, it's not even limited to women, right? It's not even limited but, to women, right? Yeah. But I think women should be leading the leading sure. the vanguard, right? Yeah. Um, but this is possibly the most cynical use of identity politics that I've seen. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. the most cynical. Yeah. That... We're kind of just that really, as far as I can tell, the Dems wanted this Mm -hmm. to foam people up and bring them to the polls. Yeah. They had no intention of taking any serious action to prevent Kavanaugh from being confirmed. And in case people don't understand enough about the, the process, because it's been so broken for so long. Right. There are lots of things that the Democrats could have done. Right. To... Um, forestall this, right? Right, and, and they're up to and including just refusing to show up for the vote. vote. You can right. just not show up to vote because if they don't show up for the vote, we can't, they the Senate yeah. can't do this. Yeah, so and the they Senate also literally can't do this without the Democrats. Yeah, participation. They also have uh, given away the Senate rules yes. over and over again. Yes. Right. The number of votes required for nomination, that was Harry Reid. Right. Right. And the the filibuster, the nuclear option, and agreeing to change it so that the 
the filibuster rules apply to Supreme Court nominees. No, right. just gave it away. That's all things that the and Democrats compromised Compromised on. and gave it away. And that's why those things exist, is yeah. for these situations right. where there's a very close right. deadlock. Because if you look at right. most past Supreme Court nominations in right. recent history, most of the justices were confirmed um, in a in a vote that tilted very hard in favor in of favor them. In favor of them. Like right. 60 or more. right. 70 or right. more or even like or even like, like unanimous, unanimous has happened so right that's happened it's not it's in actually not history. in recent history it's not unusual even no. that sometimes it's a unanimous right. vote in affirmation and, and of this that's candidate. a political move where everyone says you know what we think we can live with this justice and we want to demonstrate unity you right. know right right and actually the only two in recent history that were divided like this were thomas and now kavanaugh right right and in both situations now mind you republicans with a lot of clout and a lot of political uh capital mm -hmm. have nominated candidates that the senate has not confirmed yes we have a special word for it now yeah it's called getting borked, borked right right they right. had all the things in your favor but you got borked anyway right, right. um so they can do this. Right. They could have. They could have done this. Yeah. They chose not to do this. Even the ones that were allegedly swing votes just Please. got their fig leaves. Please. They got their, their cover. Right. And so, um, so what I actually want to make clear is that the Democrats decided to stop doing this yeah. with Thomas. Right. They so decided th to, to stop, stop standing up for, for, you know, anything. Anything. But that's, you know, so in other words, we decided with Thomas that sexual assault was not a big deal. Yep. We made that decision, was that 21 years ago? Yep. Am I counting right? I think I may be off. I'm sorry. Oh, but, it's been uh, a while. <laughs> uh, but we made that decision in the early 90s that this is not a big deal and we actually don't care. Yeah. And we're going to put that man on the court. Right. Now, the Democrats decided then that this is something they're going to take action about, yeah. move forward with, or actually make a stand about right so since we already know that about the dems yep the act of dragging this woman out in public for this dog and pony show was just cruel and perverse and about hopefully getting a few votes in november mm. yeah i mean it was crazy it was cynical it was cynical craven and depraved right now i want i want to make my position clear and i've been like ho i was hoping this weekend i would get a, enough downtime to actually write an essay on the kavanaugh oh, nomination God and just read downtime. it but yeah. um but i do want to make my position clear which is that i found blazy ford's testimony to be extremely convincing oh i, I didn't say that but i i it's, feel like that you should feel be like a given. that should be a given right and uh, that, i don't and, you i don't know, doubt anything she's saying so just to be clear. I, I don't actually doubt her however it would also be a lie for me to say that given all the political weight and money behind this behind these parties and all the machinery behind these parties mm -hmm. that can i say for sure that this was not some kind of an operation a you know a false flag operation uh that she wasn't a crisis actor or what can i say that with 100 percent certainty I cannot because there's so much money and stress on this nomination, right? Actually, what I will say, can, can I sure. go back in? So I will say, I'm convinced, I know she's not a crisis actor. Okay. I know that this isn't, um, she wasn't paid and this wasn't staged, right? Because, I'm pretty sure she wasn't paid. Because I'm pretty it, sure we, she's not a crisis we've actor. We've had people try to pay women to come forward before and women don't, yeah. like no one yeah. shows up. Well, I suspect that some of the later accusations that these these ambulances like Avenatti and whatnot were were bringing up very well could have been they they were like trying to muddy the waters at the last minute, right? I don't know. I don't but know. I don't know for sure, but I suspect. But what I will say yeah. is, I'm actually pretty sure that this was a political dirty trick in in the following way in the yeah in the following way it was a political dirty i'm not gonna right. back down from that yeah. i don't think anyone was faking anything i don't think right. blazy ford's lying but this was a political dirty trick in the way it was brought out in this way where blazy ford was coming forward to her senator right. anonymously demanding an, like dear an senator 
you've got to know that this man is not right. safe here right and i'll tell you why right i just want you to know this information do your best to keep him out of off the supreme court right her senator took that information leaked it leaked it yep. le- and she leaked it to the other side that she knew right yeah. that's how yeah. kavanaugh had this parade of women right. to right. drag out right that's how because it was all prepared they knew it, it was, was all coming. prepared yeah. so her senator leaked that information and yeah. started setting the stage her democratic senator by the way <laughs> yes for one this of the dog worst and pieces of shit ever to serve in government ever to serve in government and start immediately took that information and started setting the stage for the dog and pony show we've watched right. for the last month. Right. So, so, so in general, that's a political dirty trick. Yes, that is, that is, and that's actually not really you know yes. hidden. No, it's not. But uh, so I'm just saying I can't. I I feel like I can't given all the the money poured into it and all the corporate sponsors behind the and all the think tanks oh, right, and whatnot right. i can't and and actually i think you saw this these mechanisms starting to happen right oh right like like you say in the way that the opposing side already had all the information and had time to prepare right but you also saw it happen in the way that they started to float these trial balloons right what about this like the doppelganger theory right right what about that, that maybe it wasn't him maybe it was someone right else. and they were they were just about ready to accuse an innocent person, uh, a related innocent person, right? Right. Maybe of, it was this guy of being the, the actual attacker, right? Yeah. For the sake Maybe of he needs deflection. to lose his job. And that, that's what I mean by the kind of psyop, like paid psyop that they'll do, right? Like just do so, all kinds of crazy, crazy stuff. Right, chaff. Right, just so, chaff, throwing it out there, yeah. making it happen, and, see what sticks. And, you know... I, after watching his performance too, and some, and, and we pointed out at the time. Well, first of all, I should say, I he really triggered me because he, to me, is every prep school, every college uh, overprivileged bully every that I've was, ever known. Yeah, and yeah. he just lied and deflected on every question. comment, and actually attacked his interlocutors. It's hard for me to imagine. You know, it's, I'm pretty privileged. Right. I've never done that in a job interview. <laughs> you know? It was... And I take a lot of license with a lot of yeah, things. Right. I mean, you're yeah. pretty... I, I've actually, in the interview process, when I realized... I have actually gotten to the point where I realized this is not the job for me. And I've calmly suggested to the interviewer that he doesn't know how to run a company or fire or hire people or work with employees. Right. Right. And he was demonstrating that in the interview yeah. process, and I so that I am not interested in working with him. You know, right? But that's but I said it calmly. <laughs> well, you said it calmly because you decided not to take the job. But I didn't want the job, right? Right. He wasn't telling them. He no, didn't he want was the job. going. To, and the, I mean, that performance was so remarkable until you decode it and realize who he was. Who he was talking who to? Who he was performing for? Yeah, he wasn't performing for you and me. Right. No. Right. He was performing for his base. Yeah. For Trump's base. Yeah. And to say that this man is partisan <laughs> is like, <laughs> uh, you know, there's not even a word for how partisan he he behaved and, and came off as, right. right? I mean, not even for his party per se, but for Trump, you know, and right, for the, right. mo- the, the power opportunities of the moment. So, again, yeah. I think the Dems may have pulled this strategy wrong. Yeah. And, like, actually... Pull the strategy gambit for the other side. Yeah, I'm really having a hard time believing they're actually opposite sides. They are not. That's the. I, I it's just. It's hard for me to. That's like, where we are, and that people people don't want to believe that, and they're absolutely convinced that you know it had to be the Stein voters that fucked this all up for everyone. Like, dude, right? no, it's your people. Are, your people right. suck. Okay. Yeah, they just do. Yeah, yeah, and here here we saw that right and we saw and what's no joe, i'm supposed to vote for joe manchin because right. he's a democrat right and right. i don't he's like explain that to and me and he's but he's a democrat and democrats are going to save us from these awful republicans and, uh, 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 yeah. i feel like drools coming out of my mouth I, listening to this I, right? I can't even hear anymore so right. this is this is actually the news yeah. i don't think is worth, worth commentary entirely yeah um I, what I will say is, so what I do think is news is that we're entering another Cold War. I think that's news. Yeah. Also, while this was happening, <laughs> the same day that the, the the news cycle was entirely occupied by Kavanaugh's testimony, they rammed through 
a whole new package of tax cuts, right? More tax cuts, more tax cuts. It blew up the deficit beyond, even bigger, beyond any, you know, rational. And they did that without any news coverage. Yeah. Right? Unless you're on Twitter or following RT. I was concerned about the war games going on in Norway on the Russian border. But to find out anything about that, you've got to follow RT or Sputnik or Yeah, you've got to follow other news sources to even... Right. And even those news... Some of those news sources, you kind of have to... They're pretty neoliberal, too. Right, they're pretty neoliberal. You kind of have to read what is effectively the the Inquirer of of website news, uh, online news. You gotta, no, so you gotta be the inquirer. We feel like every week things. we've gotta go pick up the news and we'll like we're like the and men in black. <laughs> you know, oh, we're no, picking this is up the hot sheets right here. The hot sheets, <laughs> this is where it's all and it's like, oh, Elvis is still uh No, I know that guy. It's a thing. Yeah. yeah. Right. You don't wanna know the whole story, it's kind of right. embarrassing. Yeah. But that's really where we're at. And you say, So we've got troops doing war games yeah. with Russia and people are like, Oh, that's normal. Yeah. It's normal for a cold war. Right. And you right. think that cold wars are normal? Just that's terrifying. Learn, learn sir. how to pronounce this uh, what seven syllable word because it's going to come in handy. It's already uh, come in handy. Right. Neo McCarthyism. <gasps> Neo McCarthyism. Yeah. All right, I'm there for it. So that's Let's hear about it. that's the Russian uh, scandal, right? Yeah. The, yeah. It's Neo McCarthyism. And it's been kicking around for a while, but right. It's and, yeah. and so this idea. That it's normal for us to engage in war game war game escalation, where mm-hmm. the Russians and the Chinese do a war game and are like, "Huh, yes. you are tough. Yeah, I'm well, watching you." I, and then we do the same. Right. That's just business as usual. Yeah. That's not what people do when they're not engaged in a cold war. Right. When they're trying to de-escalate, we're, we're trying, trying to be de-escalate between things, wars, and, and try to be between wars, and try to actually yeah. not get into a territory that right. your cold war could turn hot. Right. 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 Like in Syria, for example. Jesus. Uh, yeah. You, you don't. You, so, you want to talk about Yemen too, but we're not going to get yeah, we're there about, today. Yeah. But, so these are the things that the news that I feel is yeah, worth all commenting. being driven off the stage, driven off the stage right. by all this bullshit yeah. with Kavanaugh. Right. I and mean, the Dems want this stuff yeah. on the stage, right. so we don't talk about Yemen and we right. don't talk about Cause Syria because they're, they're totally there for all the they're there all, for it. all the military and they don't talk about military adventures, um, Cold War escalation with right. Russia. Right, that's not part no. of the conversation. No, but so. like I said, Kavanaugh kind of triggered me, and especially in, in his speech, which I only listened to, I didn't even watch. But just like you know, just the the asshole privilege of his, you know, I gotta just, tell you, you know. He triggered me as as like um, um, what like you're a trash wannabe. Yeah, because he's there. He like you know he went to Yale and he did yeah, this and Jesus. he did that. But you know he can't afford like whitening strips. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and he's like in debt. He's got these all these financial problems. It's, that, like he's, he he wants to be. There are so right? many reasons why he should have been investigated. Uh, uh, including where he got all, uh, how he got out of debt, how right. he got into debt. Yeah, these uh, are good questions. Yeah, and who he's in debt to, to. right? All uh, these, all uh, these questions, and like you know, why, why don't you talk to all his clerks? Yeah, right. Why, I think, like, why is all that I think on the they've table? They've got and... stuff to say. Yeah, I and... think they they've got stuff to say. But you know, I th- and people who are saying, well, yeah, that never prep schools weren't like that. I went to a prep school, and stuff <laughs> like that didn't happen. I'm like. <laughs> I went to I went to a private college with a guy who lived down the hall and he killed a family in a drunk driving yes. accident and came back the, the next, next semester, semester, right? This shit This is normal happens shit. This all is the norm. time. Right. And this the and like people saying they weren't have they weren't gang raping right. girls and like they weren't loud week, about it. Like every weekend. Only every weekend. Yeah. That's all. It was not daily, but yeah, right. weekly and, maybe. And the culture of date rape at the time was such that like all the 80s movies, including joked some that, that you like. Sixteen Candles joked about it. Had jokes Porky's about it. was all about it. Was jokes about date rape right. and, and having sex with unconscious drunk girls. Right. But, yeah. Right. And so, you know, honestly, he may not be lying when he tells us that he does, has no this recollection nev- of did not happen. happen, he has no rec- recollection of trying to rape this girl with his friend at all because he was 
blackout drunk. Yes, right. that could actually be true. Right. It, it sounds it sounds like he was a blackout drunk to me. I'm there's, just, there's I'm just a guessing lot of, from the guys that yeah. I knew at prep school. Right, right. I'm just making an educated was, guess. Even you know, even in my even in my fancy Presbyterian college, there were a lot of junior alcoholics, you know, yeah. or wanted or flirting with alcoholism. Yeah, and, and so it's just yeah. like it's laughable that people would say that's just not that's not the kind of thing. And we it's do also at laughable that he would claim somehow, like in his defense. That he got into Yale, right? Like any because he busted his ass. Like please. actually, if you look at the history of like entrance standards at the time, yeah. Yale let an awful lot of people in who were legacies, and he was a legacy, was which a legacy he lied admit. about. He was a legacy admit, right? Yeah, which he, he lied about. But yeah, well, that's the thing. Legacy. He said admits he didn't have a connection to Yale. Don't his actually grandfather, have to work hard. That's grandfather the went you to need Yale, to know. right? Legacy admits don't have to work no, hard. You just have to pay. If you're able to pay full tuition, if pay your family full? pays to full tuition, you don't. You can be kind of a jerk off, and most yeah. of them are. You can be a C minus student. Bush went to Yale. He was a C minus student and a legacy admit. A you terrible did, student. You, you, Indifferent. So, yeah, that's an important thing to understand. That someone having gone to Yale doesn't mean a whole lot. It really doesn't. It really doesn't. I, so, you know. You know and it, <laughs> so and I'm not trying to trash talk. I, I, I have lots of friends that went to Yale. Right. And I'm not trash talking Yale their experience per se. or their, their degrees or, their, or the yeah. efficacy of their knowledge. Yeah. Um, I want to be very clear, though. A lot of the people that graduated from my college weren't good students. Yeah. Or, yeah. You know. Um, like I like to kind of joke that I feel like I got a good education despite being kind of a, an indifferent student. An indifferent, you know? Right. This is more to say that a lot of the folks who are legacy admits, who were not very good students, um, use the fact that they went to Yale as a cover story for being really just mediocre academically. Yeah. Like very, yeah. very mediocre academically. Right. And so... So th- that's that's all I'm trying to say. And if you if you look into his um, judicial record, his opinions oh, and whatnot, yeah. he has an unbroken line of compromising every legal and ethical principle in order to bend over backwards to service the the, the elites, the the elites, the corporations, the money in yeah. each case. It's actually completely consistent. Yeah. And that's why he was nominated, just to be clear. Yes, that's why he was nominated, because that's what it means to be a constitutional, like, originalist. That's what it means, mm. right? It's is a code is word. you don't, yeah, it, that's word. what it, it came to mean. Uh, our, our textualist, you know, yeah. right? Is that, well, if you're, you're, because you can, it's like trying to, uh, practice it'd be like trying to practice law using bible verses right oh yeah. you can pluck out a bible verse and interpret it however you want, however you want. if the, if you treat the constitution as like some kind of sacred frozen text that only the priests can understand and not say what was the what was the meaning what of was this. the context well, what was the intent right but right? you know the textualism says no you can't look at any of that which yeah. just gives you cover to write the law however the hell you want. Because you're one of the priests and you understand And what it Scalia means. was the master of that. Well, this right? is what it means. And, you know, his opinions were acerbic and funny and also rarely grounded in constitutional law. Yeah, well, there's that. Although, I, I do have to say for the record, because I always like to point out that I'm not actually... Um, uh, a fan of the Constitution? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, you do talk about how the Articles of Confederation would have been a base, better basis to build a country, right? Yeah, a much better basis. Um, the federal government would have not nearly such remarkable sweeping powers. Yeah. A lot yeah. of these things that we're looking at now would not be legally possible mm-hmm. with the Articles of Confederation. Right. Um, also, um, and I think the textualists, right? They're like a rigorous, you know, constitutional originalists. Um, they're onto something. Um, it was written by a bunch of guys for their own benefit, and the war was <laughs> fought for a bunch of rich men, white male landowners. Yeah, yeah for yeah. their you know for their benefit. Right. 
And right. they're like, hey, these article, these articles are fair. <laughs> We're gonna right. have to we have right. to rewrite this right. so we get all the money again. <laughs> right. So they did. Right. That was federalism. And that was federalism. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um and Hamilton. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not a fan of the guy. Right. I'm not a fan of his document. <laughs> right. Um no, you're more Jeffersonian. Yeah. So if Ish. you had to pick a pick a founder, yeah. uh, you know, I I really as a as a person, I, I prefer Adams yeah. as a person. Yeah. A, as a thinker, I'm more Jeffersonian, like as yeah. as philosophically. Yeah. Um, but Jefferson was a real piece of shit. <laughs> they all had problems. <laughs> oh please, he was a piece of shit. Adams had problems. Yes. Jefferson was a piece of shit. All right. So that's yeah. You can't say that, Grace. Uh, you know just did just did <laughs> okay i'm gonna check the recording and yeah. um we rambled longer than i expected to in oh, the yeah. intro but you know what i'm here for it so especially when we didn't plan a show or get to prepare but you're gonna i'm gonna check the the readings and you're gonna read your talk and you yeah, want to introduce the front porch republic yeah i'll, I'll introduce it first okay I'll be right back. Okay, good deal. And uh, you want to give me a nod that it's all good before I do a reading? So uh, Front Porch Republic is a um, okay. it's an online magazine or website that uh, their tagline is Place Limits Liberty. And every year now for a few years I've gone to their conference and next year is going to be their 10th annual conference. Um, and basically it's a bunch of guys that were college friends that all ended up being professors that saw conservatism going to hell. And we're like, you know, we should talk about some of the things that we value that neoconservatism is just like, you know, just flushing down the yeah, toilet. Yeah. And so they, so they did. And they invited other people to write with them and talk with them and publish articles and essays on this website. And that's pretty much all it is. They're trying to keep some of these ideas in the conversation. Because the conversation you may have noticed has gone to hell. But um, some of these ideas that are valuable and worthwhile, they want to make sure they are part of the the uh, information exchange that's going on amongst people on the web or just in the world. Mm -hmm. So that, that uh, these points of view don't fade from, the fade into obscurity. I mean, I mean, if they're not obscure already, right? So, that said, I would direct you to their website, take a look. I will probably, in the next month, please go easy on me, try to get this published, word for word, like my actual manuscript, mm -hmm. published with citations. So, I'm not going to have all my citations together for you tonight. It's just not going to yeah. happen. But I'll have citations on that that I publish on Fet Fun Pet Republic, so you can see and go back and look for yourself. Cool. Okay. So, I'm just reading now. Just read. Yeah. I'll try not to interrupt too much. Things are not always as they seem. So the more things change, the more they stay the same. That phrase is attributed to Jean-Baptiste Alphonse Carr, but is so widely applicable I think I've heard every public speaker use the term at least once. It is also true, especially true, when we turn a critical eye towards the last 50 years of the black community. Now, I hesitate to use the term progress to describe or frame the last half century, or anything, really, that is a personal bias. I don't believe in progress as a thing, but rather there is an unavoidable unfolding, if you will, of the consequences of our collective actions and inactions, our successes and failures to be who we are and what we are called to be. And that unfolding is inescapable and cyclical. We seem damned to make the same mistakes over and over again. It might seem on the surface to be progress, but in fact we're just looking at an illusion of layers and layers of consequences. So given that framing, I'm more interested in taking an honest look at what is and what we want to do next, rather than exploring the whys. Not that the whys are unimportant, far from it. But the whys can become philosophical and abstract, whereas hopefully... We can all concede the fact of what is and have a conversation about the actions we want to take next. And as a side note, I think a lot of the whys explain themselves when you start talking about what you did 
and what you'd like to do next. So a few caveats. First, I am not a sociologist. I am a Midwestern housewife, and I can read. These statistics <laughs> are gleaned from government documents and reports and placed in juxtaposition to each other to try and assemble snapshots of, two, of uh, 1968 and 2018. Second, there are some huge data collection gaps between 1968 and 2018. I tried to get dates as close to, to, to uh, 1960 as I could. Sometimes I found numbers from 65, sometimes 71. So I would just use the closest I could find. And third, I'm, I'm comparing American black folks to either all of the United States or sometimes to white folks and not breaking out numbers for Asians, Hispanics, Natives, African immigrants, and so on. Because nearly all the data from 1968 does not list these sort of breakdowns in the data. So it's challenging to make a useful comparison on those metrics. <clears throat> on to it. Family and social life. Until 1960, for black men, and 1970, for black women, blacks were actually more likely than whites to be married. According to the U.S. Census, nearly 90% or more of black men were married almost always to black women until about 1960. Similarly, until about 1970, nearly 95% of black women were married usually to black men. Currently, 32% of black blacks are married and 20... Uh, I messed this up in the talk, too. Oops. <laughs> Currently, 32% of black men are married and 26% of black women are. For comparison, 48% of all American adults are married. Currently, almost 70% of black children are born to single mothers. Those mothers are far more likely than married mothers to be poor even after declines in child poverty. They are also more likely to pass that poverty on to their children. Sophisticates often try to dodge the implications of this reality by shrugging that, you know, single motherhood is an inescapable fact of modern life, affecting everyone from upper middle class singles that choose to adopt after starting a career to so-called baby mamas. Not really. <laughs> it's largely a low income and dispor yeah, disproportionately yeah disproportionately black phenomenon. The vast majority of higher income women wait to have their children until they are married, and to be very specific, you know, abort any children they have early on. Yeah. Um, the truth is that we are now a two-family nation, separate and unequal. One is thriving and intact, and the other is struggling, broken, and far too often black. Demographics. African Americans are, as their name suggests, those with ancestry dating back to the African continent, usually with ancestors who were part of the transatlantic slave trade. There are over 46 million African Americans residing in the United States today, with a population expected to comprise nearly 18% of the total population by 2060. In contrast, there were 22,539,362 American blacks in 1970, comprising about 11% of the population. With 3.8 million black residents, New York has the highest population of African Americans. California, Texas, Florida, and Georgia each claim more than 2 million black residents. Previously, the largest population centers of black Americans um, were, oh, in the southern U.S. And that hasn't actually really changed, even though it might sound like it. Texas, Florida, and Georgia are is, three of the five places. Is Detroit not one of the places? It Detroit doesn't rate. It doesn't rate. Really? Because that would be Michigan as a whole. Yeah, okay. Right, it doesn't rate. Well, oh, right. I see. It's just Where, more concentrated. Yeah, there's 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 a large black population in Detroit, right. but not in Michigan. It, right, right. Right. So currently, more than half the blacks, 54%, live in the southern U.S., like it's always been. While 19% live in the Midwest, 18% in the Northeast, and 10% in the West. Now, in 1968, most blacks lived in the South, followed by the Northeast, closely followed by the Midwest, mm -hmm. with the smallest population in the West. That So what we see is a, a reflection of the total migration. Lots of people have migrated to the coasts. Yeah. And some of yeah. them have been black people, too. Yeah. But the overall pattern is exactly the same, mm -hmm. that most black people in the United States are in the American Southeast. Well, right. the, the numbers, the, the dates you're using were post-Great Migration. Yes, both of these dates were post-Great Migration. Right, 
Right. Yes. So and so nothing's things, things did change, but things haven't changed dramatically since then. Since the great yes. yes, things haven't changed dramatically since the Great Migration, which was in the forties. So from the late sixties, okay. not much of a population shift, except mirroring, like the broader mm. population shifts you see throughout the country. Where we're becoming more coastal, more, more coastal. urban, and that's that's everybody, blacks included. Um, there's a side story to have about remigration as things kind of start to collapse. Yeah, but um, not for today. Income: the annual median income of African American households is thirty six thousand dollars and five hundred forty four. Thirty six thousand five hundred forty four dollars, far lower than the national average of fifty five thousand seven hundred seventy five dollars. In 1968, national median income was $7,700. That's $55,995 in 2018 dollars. So median income has gone up $200 since 1968. I just want you guys to hear that. Mm -hmm. Just pick Mm -hmm. that out for yourselves. And for black Americans, the median was $4,755, $34,000. Five hundred and seventy-eight dollars in two thousand eighteen dollars. So um, income's gone up two thousand dollars for Black Americans. Uh, eh. Greater disparities are revealed when comparing African Americans with other racial groups. Currently, white households earn an average of seventy-one thousand three hundred dollars, while Asian American households earn an average of seventy-seven thousand nine hundred dollars. In other words, both white and Asian American households earn more than twice as much, on average, than black households. Meanwhile, in 1968, the disparity, the disparity was smaller. So, blacks have made more gains on average mm-hmm. than the national population. Um, but the disparity was smaller. There was com- more. It was more compressed. Right, right. White households only made one point six times as much as black households in nineteen sixty in uh, nineteen sixty eight. That's a actually a term historically about what happened economically. It was called the Great Compression. Great Compression of exactly. incomes. For, where, right. Yeah. Post uh, Gilded Age. You know. P- right. Post Depression. As incomes grew such that the incomes were sort of all growing and and the extremes right. were flattened. Extremes were flattened. All incomes were growing. That was a trend. We've reversed that trend. Right. And, and you see it's particularly in marginalized communities. And the right. the trend was not it's just something that happened to happen because of, you know, capitalism. It was the result no. of very specific taxation policies. That was Keynesian uh, that was Keynesian yeah, economics. Yeah. It was planned and wanted yeah. by the economic system. Was, right. Just so you know, that was the US using a planned economy. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the disparity was smaller and the disparity has grown. Poverty rates. More than one in four, uh, 26.2, African Americans live below the poverty line compared to an overall poverty rate of 14.8% and a white poverty rate of 9%. Nearly two in five, 38%, black children live in poverty compared to 22% of all children in the U.S., Meanwhile, in 1968, child poverty for all children was much lower at 15.3%, while child poverty in the black community was only slightly higher than it is now at 39.6%. So it's nearly unchanged, Mm -hmm. the rate of poverty uh, among black children. Employment and unemployment. Among all communities of color, African American workers have the highest unemployment rate. As of January 2018, the African American un- unemployment rate was 7.7%, nearly twice the national average unemployment rate of 4.9%. By comparison, unemployment rates stand at 5% for Hispanic workers, 3.5% for white workers, and 3% for Asian American workers. In 1968, black unemployment was roughly 6%, white unemployment was roughly 3%. That disparity has remained mostly the same at almost every point for the last 50 years. Um, since you know we're using a planned economy already, mm-hmm. I just want you to know that <laughs> some things aren't accidents. Right. right. Educational achievement. In general, African American students attend the lowest performing school districts and have significantly lower test scores than students nationally. 
only 18% of uh, black fourth graders were proficient in reading and 19% were proficient in math compared to national averages for reading and math proficiency among all fourth grade students were uh, 36 and 40% respectively. When even, comes, the, even the high numbers are incredibly low. The, uh, yeah, high numbers are depressing, right? When it comes to completing high school, 91% of African Americans have earned their high school diploma. By comparison, 97% of Asian Americans, 95% of white Americans, and this one stood out to me, 81% of Hispanics have attained at least a high school diploma. These, these disparities expand when students enter higher education. While the college graduation rate for what, while the college graduation rate for white students stands at sixty two percent, only forty two percent of African Americans earn a college degree. In nineteen sixty eight, high school completion in the black community was only approximately thirty percent. While in the white community, more than fifty percent earned high school diplomas. The college completion rate was at four and twelve percent respectively. So high school and college graduation rates have risen dramatically for all students over the last 50 years. And that seems impressive except for when we note that reading proficiency in the fourth grade has not changed in 40 years and in the black community has dropped. Yeah. So somehow we have far more high school and college graduates, but fewer of them can read. I'm not sure <laughs> what happened. Yeah. I, I can't, I don't have a compelling single sentence explanation. Um, but that's it's not, it's the not numbers. your field of study either. Not but, my field of study. Yeah. But these are the numbers. While the wage and income gaps between blacks and their white counterparts are wide, this is wealth, the racial wealth divide between these groups is even more pronounced. Black median household wealth is at $3,400 compared to $140,055 for white households, meaning African Americans have about 2% the wealth of whites. Much of this can That's be pretty amazing. It's just breathtaking, honestly. Much of this can be attributed to disparities in home ownership, as housing is known to make up two thirds of a typical mm. household's wealth. Home ownership <clears throat> rates in the black community are virtually unchanged over the last fifty years, and the total value of black household wealth has dropped dramatically. In nineteen sixty eight, black median household wealth was two thousand four hundred and sixty seven dollars which would be just over $18,000 in 2018. So black household wealth has dropped to one-sixth of what it was 50 years ago. Do you, you have a one-sentence explanation for that? <laughs> um, white flight. Yeah. The, 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 a, lot of, with, a lot of it has to do with the loss of their housing capital. The, the loss of housing capital over the last yeah. 50 years. That's where all that money went. Incarceration. The share of uh, African Americans in prison or jail almost tripled between 1968, 604 of every 100,000 in the total population, and 2016, uh, 17, uh, 1,730 per 100,000. The share of whites in prison or jail has also increased dramatically, but from a much lower base. In 1968, about 111 of every 100,000 whites was incarcerated. And the most recent data, the share has increased to 270 per 100,000. In 1968, African Americans were about 5.4 times as likely as whites to be in prison or jail. Today, blacks are 6.4 times as likely as whites to be incarcerated, which is especially troubling given that whites are also much more likely to be incarcerated now than they were in 1968. So this is where we were, mm -hmm. where we are. And there are many things that would seem to be different. You know, so there are more black police officers now. There are more black mayors. More women torturers. More, more women, women torturers. torturers. There, you know, there are more black faces on TV. There are more black faces in, in uh, entertainment and media. And uh, there's lots of representation. And there are many people Some who Some of it's positive. Uh, you know, and many people will say that representation matters, and I, I don't. I don't entirely disagree. It counts for something. I mean, it's something. I, I don't. I don't entirely disagree. Um, what What I ask is, what compromises did this person have to make 
to to become a, a become the, the representative the, the black token the black token. newscaster or actor or whatnot or in, what have you in a sea of white faces yeah and oftentimes it's pretty apparent yeah you know, when you it's, look it's at grotesque like the politics the yeah, yeah. so and be- different for the better in fact many would tout so-called progress but what we actually see when we compare then and now we see stagnation or lost ground and not just in the black community what would we like these snapshots to look like in 2068 hmm. and what do we need to create what do we need to do to create those snapshots all good questions that's it that's it yeah okay yeah so i feel a lot of good questions we had i i it was really well received yeah good i and yeah. i feel like especially for this audience it was this sort of like you know there's no good way for us to talk about how things aren't changing unless we talk about how things aren't, aren't changing. changing exactly right yeah and it's all no, it's think, also fraud and like well, think, what about this and what about you yeah know? i i think it's a it's a you know glass of cold water in the face it, it really is a glass of cold and really and i kind of saved wealth for last yeah because it's the most shocking number it's the most shocking number yeah and it's just like yeah. ice water in your face and, it really is and your your point was never that um white communities aren't in decline economically oh no because uh, we they see that are. here too yeah. that's actually represented right. here too they are and mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's instead of the compression that we saw historically, we've now got a, like a regilding going on, yeah. right? I'd um, call the great fleecing. Yeah, yeah, and where you know the middle class is failing, the white middle class, it's just failing, you know, floundering. But meanwhile, while while people are are you know still relitigating the two thousand eight housing crash and how people lost everything, for the black community, it's been you know. Literally, life and death. Life and death. And like a slow motion train wreck for the last 30 years. Yeah. It's like, in other words, the first 20 years of that period, there were still gains that you could kind of hold on to. Right. Right? Right. And maybe if you roll the dice, you might might win something. Yeah. In the same way that Detroit is the city that that uh you know every Ameri- every is a needle that every american city has to pass through this economic collapse uh, the middle yeah. class and the poor whites have to go through it too have to it's go through just this that too. the the, yeah. the blacks were more vulnerable the and it hit them harder first because they right. had less of a less of a cushion less, less of a wealth of a cushion, cushion less of a safety to guard net. the blow yeah. yes yes right so um so yeah all the the misery and pain that we've seen yeah. writ large for the last 10 years right. is literally the last 30 years of experience for black Americans. Right. So it's always strange to me when, you know, white liberals freak out about Donald Trump's election. Like, yeah, I don't know what, and I don't know. And or they also, freak out about you and know, you know, the I, Supreme court. Hey, I don't know what to tell you. People are rightfully concerned about how some Supreme court decisions that do affect everyone you know that that do affect you know like say your right to see your employer your right Mm. to be compensated your right not to be killed on your job Mm. you know they do have the right to worry about that but you are i believe you are right in this sense that you know the the entire uh um Spending literally two solid weeks of news Wall cycle, to news cycle on, on, on a Supreme Court nomination because of this candidate and because of Roe, right? You know, please. Yeah, this is what I have to say to all of that, right? Yeah. There, there's, Anita Hill was trying to explain this to you, right? In the early nineties, right? There's and so the Democrats much, didn't want to hear anything about right. it, right? They're not serious. They're not serious. Joe Biden thought it was unfair. Right. To Justice Thomas. Right. You know, right. people have been telling. Right. He was practically. Right. He was practically um, Hill's, you know, prosecutor. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, I just have to say, you're freaking out now. Yeah. People have been telling white liberals about this for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And they've kind of been like covering their ears and going, la, 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 tech bonuses. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. But I do also always want to 
welcome anyone who like just woke up. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. Or is just woke because up. I mean, I, st- Have I a cup still. Of tea. I'll bring you up to date. I still feel like I'm every week waking up more. You know, yeah, and yeah. it's a lot of layers. It's like it's it like, like inception. Like you know, yeah. where you got to come out of the layer oh. after layer of dream you've been living in. Yeah, and this is like the only my like yeah. uh, what is it? But my 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 freak fan boyfriends really even picked up on this. Like, here's a little news tidbit that we're just kind of glossing. Yeah. What happened to Julian Assange after Ecuador yeah. stopped covering? Yeah. Him? Yeah. What happened? No, there? it's uh, the people I. Just custody's in right now. The people I'm following on Twitter and the people I these news sources are are talking about these things, right? And are rightfully concerned about them, right? Yeah, and. Meanwhile, a lot of the hyperventilating news stories, <gasps> like the the that I they do look into, like the idea that China is spying on our motherboards, computer motherboards, right? For example, you look into the actual claim mm-hmm. made about like, this tech sabotage thing happening. Mm-hmm. It's not very important. It's not very significant. It's not what they claim it is. No, um, it's because yeah, we're in a cold war. China's bad, right? No, it's, and it's like, they already are, I mean, it's like with the Trump administration, Mm -hmm. the crimes that they're looking for have been documented for decades. They're already documented. We know. Right. Like the, 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 um, the things we're griping about the, this, that this, uh, you know, like motherboard hack thing has, has revealed all that intellectual property theft, we already know about that, know, right? It's already news. happened, right? This, this yeah. is the consequence of our shifting, basically grubbing for money so hard that we moved every bit of American tech manufacturing to Chinese factories and we're shocked, pretend to be shocked that they studied how these things are made and started making them for other people too, All right? Wow. <laughs> So go figure that who would have that thunk barn that? door is already open, right? You know, the cows yeah. have been slaughtered. They're, they're not coming back. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So I don't know. Take a moment over the next few weeks and look into the news that isn't getting uh, that isn't Rachel getting isn't play. talking about. That, right. That, that um, isn't Walt. This is yeah, well, MSNBC is not covering. This is that interesting. Fox if, isn't blathering about. I put up a. I posted like you know. Life is short. We should argue about politics all day on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, partly, mostly as a joke, poking fun at myself. Right. I, I like to make most of my jokes about myself, right. uh, not about others. And, you know, because what do I do but argue about politics on Facebook all day? You know. We have chosen, I am rarely on Facebook anymore. I, yeah. Maybe, maybe 30 minutes a week. Right. No, I. And I just try and skim through messages and catch up on, like, what some of my friends are saying briefly, and then I'd leave. Right. I'm at home with children all day. Yeah. And um, that knitting or quilting, right. I, I've tried to trip my, teach myself to knit so many times. Yes. never been successful. But I actually, I need to do something so I don't micromanage yes. them. Right. Because I'm a, I'm a really terrible a lot of, micromanager. A lot of moms find themselves in that position, stay at home right. mom, where they like, they it's a lot of the work is pretty brainless and pretty yeah. stultifying, and, you know. And I don't know about, you know, you do your... Your thing. I'm not trying yeah. to criticize anybody, uh, except for myself. I know I am not a good parent when I follow my children around and criticize the way they tie their shoes or trip their every, nails. Every and detail. Every detail of what they you got to get your mind on something else. Right. So, so I, and just listen for the screams. Listen for the screams. <laughs> respond to requests for help. You know, check in. That they're on track. And then or, you, know, you know, periodically go tell them to pick everything up. That pick they, everything up. That you put it all away. Yeah. Rather than follow them around and harass them. Right. Um, because if I don't do something else, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. I'm a real needle nose, like in your business kind of person, <laughs> naturally. So I need to distract myself. Yeah. Um, and Facebook is my favorite way to do that. I, I chat with my friends. I hang out. I read articles. Right. Blah blah blah. And when I'm not working, when I'm at home. And it feels like, first of all, it's not really 90%, but it feels like 90% of the time I spend at home during waking hours is either involved in cleaning up the kitchen, cooking food, or cleaning up the meals afterwards, you know? Oh, it really feels that way. It's not like actually... It's like all I do every day, but no, it, it's... It's not actually 90, because I true. do manage to take chunks of time now and then 
to work on my blog, to, to work, work on, on your writing. Blog, to and nap, to bathe, to yeah, read. To, yeah. you know. And we read stories for the kids and right. whatnot. But there's not, it doesn't feel like there's much else. And so I have really said, okay, if I do have downtime, uh, and I've been bad about spending too much time on Twitter now, but if I do have downtime, I'm going to try and use it to either read or write. Yeah, yeah. And we've got books piled up, interesting books. I've been, I've been, my blog is coming up on, it's well over 300,000 words now for mm-hmm. the year. So right. I have been writing a lot. And I feel like that's been, even if most of it is tedious journals, right? Mm-hmm. Just daily occurrences. The fact of the, um, the act of writing it all out has been valuable and has helped me understand how my time works and how my life works and how where the where it went and and like what my mind wants to think about and t- patterns it falls into right you know. oh, uh, so this started about a, uh, a meme I posted right? yeah sorry. Uh, and it's how I uh, so I was actually talking about myself and me spending all the time all this time on Facebook blathering about politics and incidentally I I don't respond that much. Uh, because it is this sort of like distraction for me, so I'm not. It's, yeah, you it's know. a real time suck. Right. So I'm so I'm trying not to actually get deep into writing essay responses to everything. Right. Yeah, I've been there, done that. And so I'm I'm not doing that. I'm just entertaining myself so I don't harass my own children. It got really. You realize you've spent three hours writing a carefully reasoned response, and you like you know pages and pages long and you post it and you're very satisfied and then the answer basically becomes Fuck you, you are, but where am I? <laughs> you're sitting there. right you know, like what is what is the meaning of life right. and so one person said i've really gotten sick of the politics lately on facebook and then someone else wrote a long political response <laughs> let me, sort of like let me explain the why explaining the me why right? facebook is such a terrible place to discuss politics right but now she's going on about what you know basically that line about how if you're sick of politics it's a sign of privilege it's a sign of privilege yeah. right but actually yeah, if you're not upset about the supreme court nomination or you're cynical about it it's you're just privileged yeah. oh don't even is that go. what's going on yeah i get a lot of that i well you know and i frankly am very privileged that's true yeah um, I don't know that that's actually why. You're sick of it? I'm sick of it. No. Because, let me put it this way. I'm actually not sick of politics. I don't have to talk about politics. Yeah. I'll talk about politics all day. No, I'd, and like you, like right. your arguments about abortion, I'd love to hear a new political argument. I'm all, Yeah, right. I'd love to hear it. Right. Or I'm, a new, like a, whenever I hear people talking about a political philosophy or approach to organizing or whatnot, like, or oh. ownership or management that I haven't read about already or heard about. I'm like, oh, thrilled. Tell I'm, me more. I'm fascinated. Yeah, a bunch of is why I follow it. black socialists on Twitter. Yeah, right on. Right. So the um, so I didn't get into it because I'm actually not using Facebook to get into things. Yeah. Uh, this was actually just a joke, but she let into her about like how privileged she was to be sick of the conversation. <laughs> yeah. Actually. Here's where I am with politics on Facebook. I can't get political news on Facebook anymore. I used to be able to rely on Facebook it's not for political news. Right. Right? right? Not even so much not trustworthy. It's become MSNBC, M- MSNBC yeah. and Fox News. My right. Facebook feed is now right. MSNBC right. and Fox News. You may have noticed. So uh, there's a lot of stuff, a lot more stuff that's sort of happening behind mm-hmm. the scenes, right? You may have noticed in the when Kavanaugh was making his statement, like yeah. it, behind him in the gallery of people with you know like horrified faces, mm-hmm. right? Um, they look all terribly constipated or something, you know. Right, right off behind, like over his shoulder, was a senior executive at Facebook, like they're in charge of um, like policy, North American yes, policy maybe. for for Facebook or something. Fascinating. And the fact that he was there, Mm -hmm. there was a backlash to that. There was like protests by Facebook employees for his presence, right? And it's funny that he just happened to show up there and just happened to be there. That's kind of weird. And no one thought that was a bad idea or or there were bad optics behind that. Anything, really. Right, right. Right. Just funny. That's funny and weird. So, 
I'm actually really irritated with my Facebook feed looking like Fox and MSNBC. Yeah, yeah. and the, you know they're they're tuning their algorithm to silo everyone, and, right? And even and making it even more micro targeted, right? And I'm t- I'm friends with too many freaks for it to be siloed that yeah. way, because if they show me any like. They would have to really excise huge slices of my friends list Mm -hmm. for me not to get Mm -hmm. at least those two sides. Right. But a lot of the sort of um, minority reports that that commonly come through my feed. That you used to get. That I used to get are just gone. Right. And that's because of their waiting. Right. Right. Of all this... All these the minority points, algorithms. like these freak show, yeah. like conspiracy theories, the really great stuff. Yeah, you know? If the algorithm is tuned to center on, you know, centered left and center right, right. Um, stuff that's completely outside its purview will tend to make it oscillate. <laughs> right? It'll yeah. sort of flip, flip back and forth like right. they won't know what to settle, settle right, So on. I have a wonderful freak uh, that I know, uh, Susan, out in Colorado, uh-huh. that's always posted just the most radical off the wall yeah. demented yeah. things and, I, don't, and I, I never see her anymore I, and i don't actually want facebook to vet my news sources no right? not at all no at all. i can do that vetting yeah i can vet yeah. my news sources and so you know yeah okay i'll read stuff from natural news or whatnot i'll be like okay this is largely yeah. nonsense right yeah, but i i'm i'm the person that wants i mean i i've spent my life refining my critical skills and judgment to be the person that makes those vettings for my brain you know i can do that intellectual and an intellectual is a person who's who watches over what he or she puts into his or her brain right watches the hopper watches that what's being fed in watches what coming comes out and works on fine-tuning and uh, giving themselves the most nutritional, diverse diet possible. Exactly. Because you, know? you need a lot of those micronutrients. Right. Right? A lot of these little Like you call them things. minority reports, although that's a pretty dark analogy to the story. Oh, yeah. It really is. Yeah. But. Yeah. Because I, I feel like a lot of these people are these it, tortured souls. But it is. It's like right. who, who who secretly was murdered, you know? Right. Uh, what, what's the mur- what murder actually happened? Actually did happen. Yeah. It actually took place. The, the, you know, and that's... Those are the stories I look for too. I mean, you know, right. So. Uh, those are the stories that are worth reading and actually illuminate what's happening in the news. Right. Because my favorite piece is there were only two pieces. I, I'm not tech savvy, savvy enough. I should have screen sided it. Mm-hmm. Like these two really great pieces mm-hmm. that were actually in mainstream news at the time of Benghazi. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the real Benghazi story. The Benghazi story is a story. It's not all this like psycho babble or whatever it is that you've saw in Congress. The story is that Clinton was setting up ISIS. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> right. Clinton was establishing ISIS to do all the things that ISIS has been doing yep. to destabilize the Middle East. Yep. And so when it came down and all the people who were setting it up were yep. going to be dead, yep. they were cheering at home because there's no paper trail paper trail now yeah. for any of the cia in the united states actively because we have a paper trail for uh the taliban right we have a paper trail for right. saddam and, yeah and so, anyone who thinks the u.s would never do something like that would do such a thing doesn't hasn't read enough like, history, hasn't read enough history like, or something or any, like, that's how i felt about, about this idea that oh all these war games are just normal like right. um okay they're so, America does engage in routine war games. Routine right? war games, yeah. In, among NATO, right? Right. Like with NATO allies. Yep. Right. Um, okay. But, yeah, things, it's not necessarily routine what's going on now. Not, not no. So, not, not what's going on now in the places it's going on. We'll so the Benghazi it. story yeah. is us setting up another Taliban, another right. Saddam Hussein, another uh, Pinochet, etc. In ISIS. Yeah. That was uh, Secretary Clinton's doing and work. Yep. That's why these people are calling for backup, but they're not getting it. So another, yeah, uh, another reason that I couldn't right. vote for. So right, so but, that, and I, I remember at the time I shared this information. Mm-hmm. God help me if I could find it in my newsfeed now. Right. Um, yeah. I really should have screenshotted and saved that yeah. because that was the Benghazi story. There's a story. Yeah. It's not what anyone's talking about, but there's a story. And right. so much of our news is like that, 
we're talking about one thing. Right. The story is somewhere else behind a tree buried in a trunk. Right. You know. And nowhere have you seen recently a better example of the distraction tactics yeah. that the mainstream media engages in with the collusion of the major parties, right? As, oh, right. as in what happened with this nomination. This nomination. It's right. really, t it's textbook. Right. And it like yeah. sucked your brain away. Yeah. It's just like this, and Jesus, no, it really leave did. me alone. And, and you know, this is not to minimize the horror, the experience the of, of anyone. Assault. No. Of sexual assault or, or the, the outrage of anyone who was triggered or, you know, I yeah. found it very upsetting to watch. But that... This was a psyop. I mean, yeah. how, that's how you trigger right. hundreds of thousands of people at once uh, is viewers, with a psyop. Viewers, yeah. right? That was a. They're all sticky eyeballs. And sticky so, eyeballs, and now they're know, at productivity home, went reliving down. Their, right, and yeah, and and some people are gonna are reliving trauma because of this. Yeah, right. So the Dems can get a few more votes in November. Yeah, and. And th I'm sorry, that's disgusting. It, it is disgusting. That's disgusting. I mean, you know, sexual assault is bad enough. Yeah. We don't have to use it as a cynical political weapon now. Right. Right. All right. Thank you. Hey, anytime. <laughs> we were just going to do a brief half hour it's chat just a thing. tonight. Yeah. Um, so you better get upstairs and get the kids yeah, on to, get to bed. bed. And, yeah. and I'll do the edit and get the thing up. But um, I'm glad we did take a little bit more time yeah. to talk even though it, i wouldn't call it most of it coherent and organized but again, no i hope you guys enjoyed it Sorry. <laughs> but we have we yeah we've we've been like you said uh, we've been actually in addition to your organized thoughts that you gave at the talk right our brains have been bubbling over with all, all this, kinds of uh, stuff because yeah. in addition to the hugely busy news week and weeks Right. With the stories everyone's talking about, there's a lot of other stuff oh, going oh on. <laughs> yeah, it's all happening. Anyway, so we're gonna call it. Yeah, that's it. Thanks, everyone. Have a good week. You've been listening to the Grace and Paul Podcast. Check out the show blog at podcast.blogspot.com, where you can leave comments or search for the Grace and Paul Podcast on Facebook or YouTube. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>